our sports, including great guest John McClain. John, the uh, Hall of Fame weekend, the, the Steve McMichael stuff was incredible, but overall, I always try to get like a, a report card from you and your thoughts about how it went. Well, I was partial, of course, because I presented Andre Johnson to our committee and he made it. It was his third year of eligibility. I kind of changed my presentation more than I had, and I was so excited, relieved, happy for him. He's the epitome of what we want a Hall of Famer to be on and off the field. I was happy for Texas fans. He's the first. Anytime you're the first, you know, it's special. J.J. Watt will be in four years, and I'm writing a column right now for HoustonTexans.com about Watt. I talked to him today, and uh, I've known Andre since the day he was drafted in 03. He's the first star of the franchise, one of the greatest receivers in history, and seeing how happy he and his family and Texas fans and the McNair family that owns the franchise, how happy they were. It was just extra special to me, and I also have a story on the Texans website about going behind the scenes. I try, try, try to take the readers to places they would not be able to go but would be interested in finding out about. So I had a blast. I wrote three stories overall. Now I'm writing one about Watt, who I believe will be a first ballot no-brainer in 2028. And uh, so it's always special to go to Canton. I tell all fans, if you want to go – Two places in the NFL, go to Canton, Ohio on induction, induction weekend and go to Green Bay when it's in the winter, preferably December when you'll get snow. If you go to those two cathedrals, you know, your life will be complete. John, uh, how are it's been seven years since I've been there. That was the year they announced that the expansion of the campus there. Uh, how is that done yet or what else they still have to do? My wife, Carol, uh, who you guys know, went with me, and it had been a few years. And when we were driving up to the Hall of Fame on Interstate 77, she's like, oh, my God. Used to be neighbors' hoods around there, and the Hall of Fame bought them out. They've got all kind of structures they're building, like a hotel, like a, an amusement park, a water park. They have restaurants on there now which I think is really smart, like a Shula Steakhouse and others, because when people come out of the Hall of Fame or go in, you got the food right there for them, and they're going to have uh, kind of a retirement home for Hall of Famers, and uh, that'll be special. And so you wouldn't, you would not recognize it. The stadium's been expanded. It's so much better than it was when I went there for the first time in 1985. And that class of 85, the only one that was better was the first one in 63 when they put all these great players from the start of, of the NFL in 21 to uh, 63. But my class in 85 was Joe Namath, uh, Steve Roselle, uh, O.J. Simpson, Roger Staubach, and a game that got him. Frank Gatsky from Cleveland. And one of the neatest stories in Pro Football Hall of Fame history, and there are many, it was the, when at the game on Saturday, the uh, players were introduced to come out on the field at halftime. And when Roger Staubach walked out to midfield, he's wearing his Hall of Fame jacket, his slacks, and somebody tosses him a football, and he... Pops it a couple of times, drops back. A kid along the right sideline who was a teenager ran a deep route down the sideline and Staubach threw a perfect touchdown pass to him at the goal line. And that kid is famous in Canton. He now owns some business. And if you ask anybody there, who was the kid that caught Staubach's pass? They can tell you it just like I am. I just can't remember his name. And I've asked Staubach about it. I said, when did you come up with that idea? Did you practice? He said, no. I thought about it right before. And I asked the guy if uh, he ever played. And he said, yeah. And I said, would you mind catching a pass from me? He said, sure. He said, just go deep. So the pass was perfect. Can you imagine if the kid had dropped it, but he didn't? And it's one of the most famous episodes in Pro Football Hall of Fame history. John, uh, the gold jacket dinner is the most unbelievable thing I've ever been to in my life. 
And Absolutely. You, you can't even prepare for it because you and I could tell everybody that, look, you're going to sit down and then Rich Eisen or whoever the MC is, it's Rich Eisen mostly. Rich it, Eisen. Yeah. It's going to get up and he's going to, um, you know, he's going to be Rich Eisen. He's going to introduce some people. And you think like, okay, I'm sure there's a couple folks here, you know, like it's the hall of fame. And then they just introduce a hundred hall of famers and you just can't believe you're in the room with all of these people at the same time. Yeah, Rich Eisen, who went to Michigan, made a bunch of jokes mm-hmm. about Michigan and Ohio State. People were booing him, of course. And uh, but it was it was fun. And then Roger Goodell makes a speech. The president of the Hall of Fame, Jim Porter, makes a speech. They asked Dan Fouts if he would introduce the more than hundred Hall of Famers. Some of them couldn't walk up the ramp to get to the stage to walk across it. So they sat at their tables. They put the spotlight on them. Then they got around to the, the, the reason they were there. And the Hall of Famers have not, that's when they put on their gold jackets for the first time. It's kind of for them the official thing about their official induction, even though their speech is the next day. And Andre Johnson, the way they do it, you come out of an exit. Now, used to, you came out with your presenter. In this case, that was <laughs> Gary Kubiak, his coach. But the Hall came up with an idea, and I have no idea why to have the Hall of Famers get another Hall of Famer to do it with them, which I didn't like as much. But Andre Johnson, University of Miami and Miami, picked Michael Irvin, University of Miami and Miami. And so Andre and Mike, Andre comes out and he goes through a gauntlet of gold-clad Hall of Famers, hugging him, patting him on the back, shaking hands, everybody taking videos and pictures. He goes up. On the stage, the music is blaring. Strobe lights are shining. Michael Irvin and Roger Goodell help him take off his coat, and they put that gold jacket on him for the first time, and he walks around the stage with everybody taking his picture and shooting video. Then his family came up on the stage to celebrate with him. I told him ahead of time, you will never, ever, under any circumstance, be able to duplicate that night because you just can't do it again and it is special and i wish the nfl would put the entire program on the nfl network and because it is mesmerizing john i did notice i hope you don't mind me asking that that you were a little frustrated because the committee was not mentioned i don't know if they ever were what, what by any of the uh, inductees which is i know a process with you guys a lot of time that you put into that is that something that those who are running that event should make sure that uh, an MC should say or someone else? No, if uh, a Hall of Famer is going to do it, he's going to do it. This was the first time I could remember that not one inductee mentioned the selection committee that voted him into the Hall of Fame. Usually a couple or three will thank the committee. Sometimes they thank the person that presented them. And I was honored to be thanked by the Oilers. Jerry Jones thanked me, uh, uh, Eric Dickerson. And, and I'm just talking about for me. I'm talking about the selection committee. I think when you put as much time and effort into your presentations that and I can't remember the last time we had an offer. And uh, so I tweeted about it. My wife thought I shouldn't be doing that. But I talked about the committee and what a great job they did. And so my last one, I say congratulations on the class of 2024 and congratulations on the presenters who championed them for our committee. John, uh, the big NFL news uh, right now is Brandon Ayuk and the possibility that he could get traded and that there are teams that uh, reportedly have framework in place if he agrees to an extension. Uh, this is uh, this is a turn from where I think most people thought it was going to be and, and very kind of un-49ers. Like, what do you think brought this about ultimately for them to change their minds? I think that they think he's going to be a big problem. You know, usually you, get, you find a way to give a guy some more money if you're not going to give him a new contract. Keep in mind, they are loaded at skill positions. They drafted a wide receiver in the first round since Christian McCaff was traded there. They run the ball more than any a higher percentage of the time than any other team. They got Debo Samuel. They got Brandon Ayuk, tight end George Kittle, running back uh, Christian McCaffrey. So for a team that runs it as much as they do and drafted a receiver in the first round, 
Are they going to give him a big contract? No, but I thought he would play this season, and then they would trade him and before his contract ran out. And uh, But they think for them to do this, they think he's going to be a problem, that he's driven by the money. He should – if you, you know, you go from a Super Bowl team, you should want to go to Cleveland. Browns have a chance to go to the Super Bowl. Patriots going to be bad for years. and But it looks like he just wants the money, more power to him. I'm the players getting everything they can. He's been a tremendous player. But this, uh, I'm stunned. I thought they would find a way to get it worked out. Their, their opera left tackle, Trent Williams, he's holding out wanting an adjustment on his salary. He's 36 years old. He lives here. We think he probably just doesn't want to go to training camp and be involved in preseason. He'll show up right before the season when the big checks start and uh, with some kind of contract adjustment. And uh, and I, if, if they get Amari Cooper in a deal with Cleveland, that will help ease the pain. But I think he wants more money, too. Yeah, I, I, it, it's interesting. I, I uke. Why are they trading? Are they worried about having to? Well, they said like his attitude, like John said, his attitude might be yeah, bad now. Yeah, so he, he's a he's a dude, man. Yeah, I, I don't I don't give up dudes when I get them as far as on a, on a football roster. But again, uh, they they seem to be able well, to have a rotation of a lot of different positions that they just continue to do. But, yeah, but John, they're one of the smartest front offices in the league right now. They are, and that's why I thought a way they get a, find a way to get it done. Miami's got two high-paid wide receivers and a quarterback. Philadelphia, two highly-paid wide receivers and a quarterback. But if they thought he was not going to be a pain in the butt and a distraction, they wouldn't be talking to teams about trading him. I'm not so sure I wouldn't have given him some assurances. Of course, they don't care about assurances. They want to see results. I would rather have Ayuk than Debo Samuels. Ayuk hadn't been in the league as long. They're close. But Ayuk doesn't get hit as a runner and a receiver like Debo, who plays wide receiver and running back. If I had to pick one of the two, I would take Ayuk. Uh, John, while you were talking, I was paying attention to what you were saying about Ayuk and, and what's, uh, Samuel. But there's a video. The Washington Commanders put up a video of the great Joe Gibbs being at practice today. And I, I, I mean, I, I'm sorry. I lost all concentration I know your wife would like to know that. She's a huge Washington fan. Yeah, you know, how how amazing a job did he do with that franchise? If you don't mind me, just your thoughts about Joe Gibbs, who won three Super Bowls with three different quarterbacks? Three different quarterbacks you would never mention in the same sentence as all the thing. To me, it's the greatest coaching job in the history of the NFL. You look at Bill Belichick, Tom Brady, Don Shula, Dan Marino, Bob Greasy, both in the Hall of Fame. Vince Lombardi, Bart Starr, you know, they had great players and those great players played for them. And a lot of them are in the hall of fame. No coach did what Joe Gibbs did win three separate ones in 80 after the 83, 82 season after the 87 season. Of course they cheated during the strike, but that's beside the point. And then they won in 91 and there's never been a better accomplishment for a head coach. Thank you, man. Appreciate your time. Thank you, guys. Second Bears. John McClain, Hall of Fame columnist with us, reflecting back uh, and summarizing the Hall of Fame weekend. I went for the first time.